morning everybody hope everybody had a good rested weekend let's finish this quarter off well i guess we have a little more work to do but we this is week eight and we're done with endocrinology so things should be a little bit easier for the final so let's start working on the intestines we'll do a little anatomy a little tiny physiology before we get into the diseases so here we go all right, so small intestine is kind of the star of the show. Remember, we have a duodenum right here, or duodenum, tomatoes, tomatoes. There's the stomach we just got finished with. Then we have jejunum, and then we have ileum down here. We did talk about the ileum a bit. Ileum dumps into the ascending colon. So this is, will be a review of the colon. I'm not going to talk that much about it. The cecum is down here. There's the appendix right there. All right. It's about five meters long, connects the stomach to the cecum of the large intestine. It lies within the peritoneal cavity. It has three main regions, just told you those, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Make sure you know, and these are not that developed, so any slide here is fair game for the test that... I think I have stars on most of them, but the star thing doesn't work as good here. Uh, the duodenum is interesting because it's both an intraperitoneal and extraperitoneal organ. The, remember the very first port, first part of part one of the duodenum, or that superior part of the duodenum, called the duodenal bulb or duodenal cap? That's actually intraperitoneal, inside the peritoneal cavity with the stomach, with the abdominal portion of the stomach. You can get peritonitis from holes in any, any of those parts. But the lion's share of the du duodenum is extraperitoneal. It lies outside of the peritoneal cavity, right? Uh, as we come to the duodenal jejunal flexure, the duodenum, or the jejunum, dives back inside the peritoneal cavity or peritoneal cavity. I always say peritoneal. It just rings smoother. I did some medical school. For, it was a British school. So they use peritoneum instead of peritoneum. Can't get rid of that. Anyway, uh, the ileum is intraperitoneal as well. Very similar, histologically speaking, to the rest of the stomach and the esophagus. We'll look at real quick in a minute. What's the job of the small intestine? Well, unlike when I went to school, we used to think the large intestine was the organ that absorbed water, or reabsorbed water from the fecal material. Uh, that's not really true anymore. The small intestine is what, what actually absorbs 90% of the water. That's why uh, people with intestinal blockage, they can they can get into a little bit of trouble with dehydration because they lose their ability to reabsorb water. 10% is the ascending colon, still reabsorbs water. Uh, nutrients, almost all the nutrients that we take in are absorbed in the small intestine. So it's super important for that. This absorption occurs mainly in the duodenum and jejunum. It's not that the ileum couldn't do it, but usually by the time the chyme and the prefecal material, by the time it gets down to the ileum, all the nutrients have been picked out. All right. If you, let's say you had cancer in your duodenum and you had to take some of that out, your, your ileum could kick in and start absorbing things if it had to as well. It has all the enzymes. just doesn't get to use them very often. Remember that the ileum, particularly the distal ileum's job is to reabsorb vitamin B12. We talked about that. Intrinsic factor B12 are reabsorbed through cabam receptors in the distal ileal cells. Interesting about the small intestines, there's no mechanism, there's no double negative feedback. There's not any type of system that tells them to stop absorbing nutrients into the blood. And it, uh, its absorption is indiscriminate. That means if you eat like a savage and eat tons and tons of calories, all those calories will be absorbed. It doesn't shut off after, after your 
your quota is full after your liver can't make any more glycogen, for example. Uh, so a lot of that is turned into fat. So that's why it's important if you're fighting the battle of the bulge. It's good to have small meals and not overeat. That's a big problem with obesity. What normally gets absorbed? Everything. Carbohydrates, proteins, fats, water, electrolytes, vitamins, drugs. A lot of drugs are absorbed. NSAIDs are absorbed in the small bowel. A lot of this came from Sherwood, by the way. If you ever read Guyton, very classic physiology book, uh, but it's a, ter it's a terrible storyteller again. Uh, Sherwood, again, it's almost like Porth's pathophysiology. Sherwood is a very good storyteller. We actually use this in medical school that I went to, uh, and Guyton was a reference, but this is the main book. She's a very good, was it she or he? I can't remember if it's she or he, but... A uh, very good storyteller. Anyway, the small intestine is an amazing, resilient organ. You can have cancer and lose 50% of your intestine, and you will have no loss of digestion uh, or absorption. No problem with any of that. Uh, how can this be? Because the small bowel has a tremendous surface area. and well, It's got three folds. You, I wanted to, I took this out one time and then I had to put it back in. You guys just don't understand this very well. So let's go over this. Uh, so here's, and we'll we'll get to those layers. But let's look at the just a little histology. Very familiar, right? We've talked about this since the esophagus, and I'm not even going to talk about this because it's pretty much the same when we get into the large bowel. So we have again the innermost layer that's in contact with the fecal material, that's the mucosal layer. It's made up of simple columnar epithelial cells, not mucose epithelial cells. Uh, these epithelial cells don't secrete mucus like the simple columnar epithelial cells of the stomach all secrete mucus. That's why they get the name mucose cells. These don't. So there's lots of goblet cells in the epithelial layer as well. The mucosal layer is made up of an epithelial layer, a lamina propria, which contains some pretty good-sized lacteal vessels, which are connected to the portal circulatory system. So we'll, I think I actually took some of that. I cut this down a little bit so I didn't get too deep into it. And then there's a muscularis mucosae as well. Uh, Moving away from the lumen, we have the submucosal layer, which bigger nerves, bigger blood vessels, and we have Meissner's plexus, part of the enteric nervous system. Remember, Meissner hides in the basement. The bigger blood vessels, uh, there are bigger nerves, but there are nerves in this mucosal in the lamina propria. There are nerves there, so we can have we can have trouble there. Uh, it doesn't take much to irritate the small bowel because of that. Then we go into the muscularis externa layer. Uh, watch the AKAs on this. There's the muscularis propria. Sometimes it's just called the muscularis. It's smooth muscle. or uh, It has the same layers. It has a double muscular layer, circular inner layer, longitudinal muscle. Smooth muscle is the outer layer. And then it has our box plexus mixed in uh, between those two layers. It's sandwiched between those layers. And then last but not least, we have the serosal layer. So here's, now we come back to that massive surface area. The intestinal wall is triple folded. So we have the circular folds. They have a lot of AKAs. I think you learned them in gross one anatomy as the plicae circularis. That's not actually the most common name. They're called circular folds or the valves of Kirtring or Kirtring's folds. Plicae circularis is actually a pretty old term. I'm not even sure if that one will show up on board. So this is the first folded layer. It gives the lumen of the intestine a kind of velvety appearance, even with the naked eye. Uh, these circular folds are studded with little projections called villi. So these are the intestinal villi. And then the intestinal villi are themselves studded with microvilli. 
and microvilli are actually where the epithelial, the simple columnar epithelial cells are. Okay, let's see some pictures. This is always confusing. So here's a nice, nice picture of the intestine. Here's the lumen here. So it's we have the intestinal wall. When I say the intestinal wall, I'm talking about the entire thickness of the intestine. And here you can see there's these little folds, right? And we saw these folds in the in cadaver lab or in uh, what was that? Gross one and gross two. I forget which one. Gross two, I think. And yeah, if you do a cross section, and you can actually see what they look like. But these these folds are called the circular folds or valves of Kirkering or plica circulares. But let's see who they really are. And uh, or before we see that, then we have more folds. See how they're see how the valves of Kirkering they kind of they kind of make out pouchings in the intestinal luma luna uh, lumen. And then we have more outpouches of the circular folds themselves. And those are the villi. And what we can't see is each one of these little projections, it is studded with more projections, and those would be the microvilli. So it's really confusing here. Also, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the physiology or anatomy questions. So the circular folds are made up of what type of tissue? Uh, well, they're made up of the mucosa layer, mucosal layer completely. You can see this little line right here. Let's see, did I turn on my markers? Yes, I did. See this little line right here? That's the muscularis mucosae. So that's the the end of the muscularis layer. Or mucosal layer. Anything deep to that is submucosal tissue. Uh, let's see. Let's go, I guess, how about orange? Right? So this is all submucosal tissue, but notice the submucosal tissue pokes up into the circular fold. So therefore, the, back to the question, the circular fold is made of the mucosal layer and most a lot of the submucosal layer as well. All right, see how that works? It's all submucosal layer. And we can see how the nerves are kind of on top, drawn on top uh, between the submucosal and the mucosal layer here. Though so that's Meisner, that's Meisner's plexus right there. All right, we good with that? All right, let's actually blow one of these up and take a little closer look at it. Okay, on this slide, we can see a little bit better the valves of Kirchring uh, or the plaque circularis or whatever you want to call them. We can see that they're, uh, they're completely made up of mucosal layer, and we can see that the submucosal penetrates. And it's kind of the root or the core of a valve of Kirchring whatever you want to call it, of a circular fold. What's the core of a circular fold? It's actually submucosal tissue. We'll see some um, bigger vessels in here as well. All right, we can also see the, uh, the Meisner's plexus here between the muscularis mucosae, submucosal layer. Okay, let's blow it up more. So now we're looking at one villus. We're looking at this. Let's look at this one right here. We're just looking at that little peg, which is one of the many studs uh, or projections that comes off of a circular fold. Let's look at that one, and, and now we can see what it looks like. We can see that it's lined by the endothelium. These are simple columnar cells. Could have been drawn a little more columnar-like. Lots of goblet cells now. Uh, we are looking at, and we can see uh, the lamina propria is filled with blood vessels. There's actually should be a lymphatic in here uh, as well, which we will look at here in a second. Uh, but this is all lamina propria. This is this is all um, the mucosal layer still. Submucosal. Where's the submucosal layer? We have to go up to a bigger view to see the submucosal layer. 
right? We're just looking at one of these pegs. That's why it's all lamina appropriate around it in muscular mucosa. If we go to a bigger view, now we can see the core of the submucosal layer, how it makes the core. Not of the villi, though. It doesn't make the core of a villi. It makes the core of a circular fold. Okay, so study this and get that straight in your brain. And Yeah, so we have these projections called villi, and then we also have these kind of reverse projections called the crypts of Lieberkuhn. And this is where the magic cells are. These are the enterocytes that live here. And these are the ones when they, they're, they're made down here as a stem cell. Stem cell gives birth to them, and as they mature, they're ratcheted up and up and up. Once they get out of the crypt, they're mature, and they're able to absorb. They have enzymes in the brush border here on these little hairs you can start to see. We'll blow those up too, but that's where the enzymes sit, and they can absorb all the carbohydrates and proteins and fats. Right Here's another more pro anatomically appropriate picture here with a lymphatic vessel. There's a blind lymph capillary. Uh, those are called lymph uh, lacteals. It's just a lymph capillary, dead-ended capillary. Notice the nerve in there as well, right? I mean, here's, here's the food. This is where the food is right here in the bacteria. So it doesn't take much to get in there and trigger pain, cause pain. Okay. Let's look at these. Let's blow this. Let's take now one of these cells. Let's take that one right there. Let's take that simple columnar cell and look at it. It's got like hair on it. And this is the so-called brush border. So these enterocytes are really strangely shaped. The plasma membrane of these cells, I mean the plasma membrane goes all around the cell. I'm just going to draw it real fast. Uh, but the plasma membrane also does some crazy, uh, makes some crazy conformations here. These little hairs that stick up. Okay, and those are called the microvilli. Microvilli. Uh, and this is also called the brush border because it, if you put a whole bunch of these, it kind of looks like a brush going across there. Getting a little out of hand there with my marker. Let's see if I can get rid of it. There we go. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so when you hear microvilli, these are, they're just extensions of the cytosol. Microvilli are part of a simple columnar cell of enterocytes. Got it? And they're lines. See, we got a lot of enzymes starting to show up here, and there's a lot of uh, all that digestive magic that happens here. These tight junctions are really important. We'll talk when we talk about Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. These guys are really important because if you're a bug trying to get in here, you can't get through these tight junctions. It's really hard to get through the cell. It's easier to sneak between the cells because the goal of a bug is to get down here in the bloodstream. This is, I guess, a lacteal. You can get in the lymph system or you can get in the bloodstream this way. Tight junctions are pretty good. Desmosomes, remember, uh, hold the cells together. We have hemidesmosomes down here. Hemi hides in the basement, H and H. Hemidesmosomes hide down here. And we do we talk about Pephagus vulgaris. Uh, attack against BB230 of hemidesmosomes. Don't worry about that right now. Okay, so lamina appropria of the villi, we already said, oh no, we didn't say. So they contain some other stuff in the lamina appropria. Uh, they contain galt, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, which is super important because we got a lot of bugs. There's bugs everywhere. Your digestive system is fairly dirty, filled with bugs. They're trying to get in all the time. And so if they do get in, we have to have an extra kind of lymphatic system there, a protection. And these aren't lymph nodes, it's just like an extra lymphatic system and it's called gut-associated lymphoid tissue uh, or nodule, they, which are just, they're not lymph nodes though, they're, they're, they're nodule shape, but they're not lymph nodes. Uh, it's a major defender against uh, infectious organisms, very, very large in the ileum in particular, where the bacteria can farther away from that acid environment, the easier it is for bacteria to to harvest and cause trouble. 
And the ileum, they're so big, they get a different name. They're actually called uh, pyres patches, pyres patches, even though it's not, I guess, what's that old saying? The first vowel does, the second vowel does the talking, the first, what is that? I forget what it is. Back in kindergarten, we learned that. You guys know what I mean. Uh, pyres patches. Uh, anyway, they're uh, also called aggregated nodules. They're so big in the ilium. But they're the same thing. They're part of galt. You can actually see uh, a giant pyres patch right here, all lymph. It's like a super, if you're a bug, you don't want to mess in or that thing. It's like a nuclear, it's like a, uh, I don't know what to say. It's just, it's like a death star. You go in that thing, you'll be shot to pieces if you're a bug. You want to stay away from those things. Lysosoma is what I was thinking. It's like a lysosome of a stomach. Okay, there's a cute little raccoon. Uh, so Libercoon the raccoon, I showed you the crypts of Libercoon. So we don't have stomach glands. There's no pyloric glands or no fundic glands or accented glands. or There's none of those things. They have the one type of gland which still has cells, including endocrine cells. Uh, those are called the crypts of Libercoon or sometimes just the crypts or sometimes intestinal crypts. Uh, but their pits are found between adjacent intestinal villi, and they're sort of like stomach glands. And we can see some of the cell species in here. Uh, the did they put the? Where are the stem cells? They should have put stem cells. I'm not seeing stem. Maybe it's, I mean, stem stem cells are usually right about here. So I guess they left them out. But there's magic, like basal cells in the skin. There's magic stem cells that multiply through mitosis and give rise to all these things, as I said. And these guys are conveyor belted up. And we, it, we'll learn here in a second that when they're immature baby enterocytes, they actually secrete a lot of water that bubbles up out of the crypt. So we have a, let's, these crypts are like rivers, and they have water flowing out of them. Um, and part of the reason is because we don't want bugs to get down here. Uh, these cells are more delicate. We don't want bugs to get in here any of, anywhere. And so it's hard for a bug to swim when the, there's a flow of river, or current flow coming out of there. Uh, and interestingly, when, when you come out of the crypt, they start, you can see they've matured now into enterocytes with the, uh, with the microvilli here. So these guys have enzymes and are ready to absorb cells. So they don't secrete water anymore. I'm getting way ahead of my uh, my slides, but yeah, that's where we're going. Uh, so they're filled with things that uh, make things but don't absorb things. No absorption or no breakdown of nutrients occurs down here. These are strictly for kind of water flow purposes. Okay, let's see. They have stem cells. We talked about those. Um, the cell population. So there's enterocytes. There's panath cells. We've got to talk about these panath cells. We talked about mature and immature enterocytes. Goblet cells, we talked about them. They release mucin, which is converted into mucus. Uh, there's, in, there's endocrine cells here, enteroendocrine cells. We need to talk a bit about them. But when we talk about Crohn's disease, we will talk a lot here about panath cells. So let's look at them now. Uh, they're defenders. They, they're, they kill bacteria. They can phagocytize. They can eat bacteria like Pac-Man. Uh, and they can release things that kill back to uh, two types of antibacterial enzymes that explode uh, bacteria and viruses. And those are called lysozymes and defense in. There's other ones, but those are the main ones. Lysozyme is also found in the saliva as well. And um, yeah, these are anti antibacterial enzymes that help destroy bacteria that start to build up and try to invade uh, the mucosal layer of the intestinal wall. As we said, they can phagocytize. That means they can eat. They can eat the bug flat out. And they, the population of these cells gets more dense as you move toward the distal ilium as the 
bacteria population can also rise in this region as well. All right, so panacea cells, they have the ability to phagocytize certain bacteria. Even protozoans can be eaten by these things. So that's a little unusual. If they can't kill the bug with uh, the spray that kind of comes out of them, then they'll eat them. So they do everything they can to stop bacteria from getting into your gut wall, into your intestinal wall. They're, the population is much more dense toward the distal ileum because more bugs can grow down there as the acidic environment is pretty much gone. Not many bugs grow in the, in the duodenum, especially that superior portion. It's too acidic there. Um, but things can start to ramp up as you get down in the ileum and the, even the distal jejunum. Mutations in these panacea cells, when we get to Crohn's disease, mutations in these panacea cells is thought to be one of the causes of Crohn's disease or one of the, the factors, the aggravating or the encouraging factors of Crohn's disease. Without panacea cells, you have trouble, out, trouble fighting infections. Crohn's disease is a full thickness infection, inflammation of the intestinal wall. We'll look at a bunch of other things that increase encourages Crohn's disease to develop. So there are some intro, I guess this will be our endocrinology for today. There are some intro endocrine cells here. Main players are CCK, cholecystokinin. Uh, those are secreted from eye cells. Where do all, where, where's all this stuff coming from? Uh, the crypt of Libricoon. We have intro endocrine cells scattered about, usually down in the bottoms. But And they're secreted not into the lumen here where the water is flowing out, right? They're secreted into the interstitium. And they can jump right into the bloodstream or the lymphatic system, but they can get into the bloodstream and go do their jobs. All right, we have secretin, which comes from S cells. We have GIP. Uh, you might have seen that actually on the drawing. We didn't talk about that at that point, that dreaded drawing that is coming back and you're going to hate it. Um, but GIP gastric inhibitory polypeptide is released from K cells in the crypts of Libricoon. There's some motilin that's released. There's serotonin that's released from the introchromophin cells, not introchromophin-like cells, not the ECL cells. We have another introchromophin cell which releases serotonin. There are two more hormones as well. Uh, there are paracrine in function, somatostatin and histamine. We won't get too crazy into those. Let's talk about some of these, though. We have to talk about CCK, cholecystokinin, and secretin. So both of these are released or stimulated, or both of these hormones, their target is the pancreas. They stimulate the pancreas and gallbladder to do their thing, which is release uh, bile and release pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic activity equals enzyme secretion. Bicarbonate is sec uh, released as well. We'll talk about Brunner's glands, but bicarbonate is double released. Uh, pancreatic growth factor or pancreatic growth is also stimulated by these uh, and the release of bile from the gallbladder we said already. But these are hormones. They get right into the bloodstream and that's how they travel. On the other side of the coin, they can travel up to the stomach and they inhibit gastric secretion and motility. CCK is secreted from introendocrine cells in the crypts of Lubricon, Lubricon called eye cells. Uh, CCK uh, lives in the, or these eye cells live in the duodenum and jejunum. Secretin is produced from S cells that live in the di uh, the duodenum as well. How about cholecystokinin versus D cells? So we've got a few more stars on this slide. We're a little endocrinology here. Uh, so, so CCK, it's a hormone, and it can travel to the stomach. And it, remember, we talked about the D cells. I just tested you on the D cells. Uh, it can bind. It has binding sites. It has CCK2 receptors. Or no, CCK1 receptors it binds to. Uh, and it shuts off parietal cells, chief cells. That's going to inhibit the release of hydrochloric acid and pepsi pepsinogen. It can bind to ECL cells and inhibit them from releasing histamine which histamine is a, one of the most potent stimulators of parietal cells. 
and it also binds to G cells and inhibits gastrin. And without gastrin, you're going to inhibit hydrochloric acid and histamine release. And if you inhibit histamine release, that's one of the most powerful stimulators of hydrochloric acid. Oh no, I can hear you say, not this damn thing again. Yes, this damn thing is back. It will be back on the final. So make you sure that you know this. Go to that YouTube video if you didn't do good on that part of the test and get this stuff down because I'm not going to re-explain everything. I'm going to just show you where here's CCK coming in, pancreatic CCK. It's a hormone coming in through the bloodstream. Guess we can make a little blood vessel there. Coming in from the bloodstream. It's binding not to CCK2 receptors right? It's binding to CCK1 receptors. It's stimulating the pyloric or antral D cells to release somatostatin, and then somatostatin just does its, does its thing. It shuts off ECL cells, shuts down G cells. But fundic D cells, it also binds to fundic D cells, and it stimulates somatostatin to shut down parietal cells. Chief cells as well. I didn't draw that in because I'm running out of room to draw stuff. And it also, it, uh, somatostatin inhibits ECL cells. So you're kind of getting a double stimulation. So it really shuts down these ECL cells. All right, I don't think I need to say anything more about that. How about GIP? Uh, its main function, as we said already, stimulate the release of insulin from the pancreas uh, in preparation for getting, because we're starting to get uh, carbohydrates into the bloodstream now, right? Glucose and maltose, mainly glucose, and that's got to be taken in insulin. We need insulin for cells to grow receptors. Insulin stimulates cells to to take in glucose, so we need that system going GIP is released from the crypts of lubricun, uh, K cells, as we said. It also inhibits gastric secretion, um, and we won't get into it. It's a very weak inhibitor, so that's why I really didn't mention it before. Motilin inhibits gastric and intestinal motility, released from intraendocrine MO cells, MO cells in the duodenum and jejunum, stimulates gastric motility, helps the stomach digest, churn up that stuff, churn up that food, that Big Mac that you ate, stimulates intestinal motility. Enterocytes, and I talked about this already, but uh, they're born by st in, via stem cells in toward the base or the bottom of the crypt of Lieberkuhn. They're conveyor belted up as new ones are born, just like how the epidermis, how basal cells create carotinocytes and they go up they differentiate as they move up and they slough off. These slough off as well. Immature um, ent enterocytes, I always said this, immature ones, which are just born, they're still in the crypt of Lieberkuhn. Uh, these guys release water and quite a force of water, and it creates a river coming out of the crypts of Lieberkuhn and it discourages bugs and food particles from getting down there. If you get food particles in the crypt of Lubricum, can, it, can these food particles be broken down? Are there enzymes to break down food particles inside the crypts of Lubricum? No, they haven't developed, they haven't developed uh, the enzymes yet. The mature enterocytes will have enzymes to break them down, but there's no mature enzymes inside the crypts of Lubricum. So that river is thought to help keep the nutrients out of there as well. Uh, enterocytes become mature once they are kind of ratcheted, conveyor belted out of the crypt of Lubricum. Mature enterocytes make vital digestive enzymes and no longer secrete water. Right, so here's these guys being ratcheted up and all of a sudden they're mature. Here when they're green they're secreting water like crazy. Right, so no food particles or bacteria can get down there because you got a flow of, and it's not water, it's mucin and mucus, and but it is it is a water, watery, very watery type. It flows like a river. All right, so I think we talked enough about that. So there are three. This is easy. I like it. One of the threes, right? 
guys are starting to know my testing. I like it when there's three. It's really easy for me to make a question. All of the following are enzymes embedded in the plasma membrane of enterocytes, except blank. So we have peptidases, a.k.a. intropeptidases, a.k.a. Introkinase, introkinases. So I, I learned them as peptidases. Uh, these guys activate pancreatic enzymes, trypsinogen. I mean, trypsin is the big one, right? You, uh, just like pepsinogen turns into pepsin in the stomach, the big protein breaker downer. It doesn't break it all the way down into amino acids. We need to trypsin to keep working on those those fragments of protein. And so these guys, these peptidases, break that protein down, or they don't. They don't break anything down. They activate trypsinogen and turn it into trypsin, which does the breaking down. Well, I think I took those slides out. Though I'm getting too uh, too much into the gastrointestinal physio physiology, which you should already know. Uh, there's disaccharidases that break carbohydrates down into smaller units, sucrase, lactase, maltase, isomaltase. And then there's intestinal lipase, which breaks down fat. We already talked about fat in, in, in endocrinology. Where fat's broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. Which one of these is burned? Which, we can make glucose out of which one of these? Yes, glycerol. Fatty acids cannot be run through glycolysis. There's a pancreatic lipase as well. That it also breaks down fat. Uh, so what do the mature intro, uh, enterocytes do? We already said uh, they stop secreting water now, but now they uh, they break down and absorb absorb stuff. Uh, so then we won't get into all the mechanisms, but they can break down carbohydrates, fat, and proteins. Uh, they get help from pancreatic enzymes. Maybe we'll talk about those quick next time. Um, but these molecules broke are their their job is to break down carbohydrates into tiny little pieces so they can be reabsorbed inside the enterocytes because that's where the magic happens right in the intestine the enterocytes are taking in all these pieces of different types of food which have already been broken down into their tiniest um, part that they can Okay, and then they're kind of spit out the basal lateral surface where the interstitium is, and they're absorbed in the capillaries or lacteals. Fats go into the lacteals, uh, proteins, amino acids by this point, and glucose is taken in by the capillaries, and they go into the bloodstream. One vulnerable area, and we've talked about this before, if you lose your distal ileum, that's not a good thing. Right? I said you can lose 50% of your intestine, but you can't lose that distal ileum. Well, you can, but you have to take vitamin B12 injections. But if you're on an island somewhere, you're going to die eventually. Vitamin B12 deficiency, a horrible death. So, yeah, so if you lose your distal ileum, you can absorb uh, vitamin B12 and bile salts. We haven't talked about those. So what? So you would develop a vitamin B12 deficiency which will morph into a megaloblastic anemia, and then you won't make myelin, and you're, you'll have all funky red blood cells, tons of immature red blood cells floating around. Remember those giant red blood cells that don't carry oxygen very well? So yeah, then you'll go down that road. Brunert's glands we should talk about, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, Brunert's glands, also called duodenal submucosal glands, because they do live in the submucosa. Uh, they're a mucus gland. They're not found in the crypts of Lieberkuhn. They're up in that. Uh, they're, they're, they have nothing to do with the epithelium. They pass through the epithelium to open into the intestine, but they don't, they're not born in there. They're in the submucosal layer. They're found mainly bef between the pyloric sphincter and the major duodenal papillae. It's where they live. Remember anatomy, there's the stomach. Uh, so here's the food, food would be shot out the pyloric sphincter here. Here's the major duodenal papillae right here. Ampulla vater here, main pancreatic duct, common bile duct. We'll actually look at that. I put some slides back in. Maybe we'll even go a little long today because we did miss a lecture uh, Monday.
But yeah, so Brunner's glands live in this region. There's some down here as well, but most of them are right here. And they secrete mucus like crazy as well as bicarbonate. Their job is to kind of take out that acid that comes out of the stomach, secrete large amounts of alkaline mucus, very rich in biocarbonate. Biocarbonate is super basic, right? Uh, they also secrete uh, mucus. Well, they have to secrete mucus. I already said that. Uh, but there's bacterial cytal factors we won't get into, and there's other stuff that helps keep mucin from degrading but by the acid, and that's getting too deep for us. What stimulates their secretion? Well, the presence of food. Just when you think about food, when you swallow food, and you're, uh, we said that the enteric nervous system releases acetylcholine and GRP are released from those nerve endings in the enteric nervous system. Uh, that also, that also, that vagal uh, stimulation, those are from the vagal nerve, it also stimulates Brunner's glands. And it, uh, the hormone secretin also stimulates them. And when your sympathetics turn on, these are inhibited. So they have sympathetic nerve fiber plugged into them that turns them off. And that can be a bad thing. Their job is to neutralize stomach acid and protect the epithelial lining of the intestine. Makes sense. pH goes from 1.5 in the superior duodenum down to 7.5 in the proximal, so it slowly knocks it out. It also lubricates the intestine to make that ground-up Big Mac slip through your intestines. It's a member of the succus entericus. What? The what? You guys you don't, usually don't know what that word means. You should know what that means. That's an AKA for intestinal juices. Succus entericus. Here's just a slide, Crips of Lubricoon. So I could tell by this slide that here's the Brunner's glands. Or circular, if we get a, a, the right cut through there. And yeah, so I can tell we're, we're in that, that proximal... Well, we're between the pyloric sphincter and the major duodenal papillae. Here's the succus entericus, or sometimes it's called int intestinal juice. So it's the stuff that's secreted from the intestine. It's yellow in color. Does that turn on a light bulb at all? Ever been really sick, sick have the stomach flu? Would you throw up sometimes? It's not bile. You're not throwing up bile. Bile's yellow as well. But the succus entericus has a yellow color to it. Uh, if you're throwing up really bad and you start getting the dry heaves, you'll you'll squeeze the succus entericus out of the small bowel into the stomach and you'll, you'll vomit it up and it's yellow in color. And here's all the different components of it. I'm not going to test you on this slide, but... Um, yeah, mucus from Brunner's glands is part of it. Some of the stuff we talked about. Pancreatic enzymes are uh, floating in that stuff. Enterokinase. Okay, what about stress and ulcer? So I like this slide because now we're getting some pathology. So I said sympathetics are hooked up to Brunner's glands. So if you just had a big steak dinner and then you got some horrible news, the stock market's crashing or whatever the news could be, and you're in the process of digesting that meal, we know that stress turns on your sympathetic nervous. That's the tiger out, right? And it shuts off the Brunner's glands while you're digesting. And you need the juice that comes out of Brunner's glands, right, to, to knock out that acid. And so without that, without that mucus and bicarbonate, you're going to have some pretty acidic ground-up uh, filet mignon going through your intestine. It's going to damage a lot of enterocytes as it does because until you calm down, uh, the Brunner's glands are going to be turned off. So uh, people who are under chronic stress do have a higher rate of duodenal ulcer or PUD, peptic ulcer disease. And, um, yeah, it's thought, Guyton says, which, I mean, Guyton's not really, a, it's our board book, so we have to pay attention to it, but it's not really meant to be a physiology, uh, like Johnston is the one I really like. It's a pure physiology, GI physiology book. Uh, but nevertheless, it's certainly a cause of dyspepsia and even duodenal ulcers. Guyton says 50%. I think that's really pushing it. 
All right, let's do a little bit. I mean, I don't know how I've lost track of time. We had this crazy motorcycle driving out there. Had to cut some stuff out. Uh, let's do a little of this. Let's look at just a tiny bit at the pancreas. We talked about it a little bit. It's long, narrow, flat organ. Its medial portion is cradled between the descending transverse portions of the duodenum. Laterally, it attaches to the spleen. Uh, it's very horizontal in its orientation. And it is a retroperitoneal organ, except... Right, except I should put, let me put my first note today, my first fixed note of the day, 44. It's retroperitoneal except the duodenal bulb, the DB. The duodenal bulb is still interperitoneal. There's a cartoon of it. Okay, it's pancreas. Duodenum is here. Tail. We'll look at the parts in a minute. Uh, peritoneal cavity is up here, right? So that's the visceral or parietal peritoneum. Uh, in blue, I'm drawing here. It's the parent. I should have went down here. Parietal peritoneum is here. So it's behind. It's in that first little compartment. Uh, and yeah, anterior perirenal space. Or retroperitoneal. All right, here is the parts of the pancreas. There's a tail, the body, the neck is very thin, tough to see that. And then the head is huge, and then it has this little weird piece right here, the uncinate process. You can see uncinate process is probably about here, really. I don't think it's, I mean, this is all head from here to here. That's head. What's this thing? This is important. Ooh, yeah, the main pancreatic duct. Remember that guy? Main pancreatic duct of Wursong? Got to know that. Here's the common bile duct, or sometimes just the bile duct coming down. They meet into a, a ampulla. That's the ampulla of Vater. Hepatopancreatic ampulla, I think it's also called. There's an accessory pancreatic duct goes into the minor duodenal papillae. We could never see that, but in lab we could see the major duodenal papillae quite nicely. Yeah, those are, you need to know those things. Pancreas is the largest digestive gland in the body. It's got kind of a lobular surface with a, co a connective tissue over the top. It doesn't really have a capsule around it like the adrenal gland, though. It's a delicate organ. It has endocrine tissue, it's an endocrine gland, but it also has exocrine function as well. And it has a very extensive ductal system we'll look at here in a bit. And there's the, we just looked at the main pancreatic duct of Warsung it's got. And that's all these little, little exocrine glands dump their juices into that. And that's all ultimately dumped into the descending portion of the duodenum. All juices are secreted by exocrine pancreatic, pancreas, pancreatic glands, everything I said. The endocrine glands, of course, delta cells and things like that, um, they dump into the blood. They're true hormones, glucagon and insulin. Talk about that when that time comes. Within the head of the pancreas, the duct of Wurzung joins the common bile duct to form the ampulla of Vater a.k.a. hepatopancreatic ampule. There's some sphincters we need to look at. Uh, all of the endocrine or exocrine pancreatic juice and juice from the gallbladder and juice from the liver, they mix in the ampulla of water, and then they sit there until uh, that the sphincter of Odi is opened. Once the sphincter of Odi opens, that juice jumps into the descending duodenum. Most people have an accessory pancreatic duct which connects to the minor duodenal papillae. There's no bile. It's not, there's no communication normally with the common bile duct. We'll look at a picture here in a second. Everything I said when prompted, juices are injected into the descending duodenum through the sphincter of Odi, a.k.a. 
made or th- through the sphincter of Odi, which controls the opening uh, of the major duodenal papillae. Sphincter of Odi has an AKA hepatopancreatic sphincter, which is a kind of faucet for the hepatopancreatic duct or the duct of Warsaw. Uh, let's see. Yep, everything I said already. Do we have a picture? There we go. So let's. it's always best to look at a picture. So there's the main pancreatic duct. Usually splits into a, some of the pancreatic juice can go straight into the duodenum via the minor, or the accessory pancreatic duct. Uh, most of it goes down here and it mixes with bile and hepatic juice into this region, which they could have made this a little fatter. And that's the ampulla vater or the hepatopancreatic ampulla. It has a major sphincter right here uh, that's called the sphincter of Odi. Okay. It's also called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. You could call it that as well. Sphincter of Odi is classic. you got to know sphincter of Odi. And yeah, there's a couple of guardian sphincters as well. There's the main pancreatic sphincter and a bile duct sphincter, common bile duct sphincter, not as poor, as important. So that's the normal plumbing there. Now here's our pathological condition, and we'll get out of here. There's something called pancreas divisum. It's seen in about 10% of people. So normally, uh, 70% of people have this plumbing, exactly. And then the other 30 have variations. And the most common variation of plumbing is this pancreas divisum. And what the deal is, is let's just go look at it. Here is the deal. So we have the main pancreatic duct, right? Pancreas would be, I'll just draw it right here. Actually, we'd go down to here. So we have the main pancreatic duct is not going down, and normally it would come down like this, right? And connect with the, the main um or the common uh, common bile duct, right? Main pan- pancreatic duct and the common bile duct come together to form the ampulla vater. Okay, but that doesn't happen here in this case. Get rid of that. Okay, so there's no connection. Sometimes there's this little weird accessory connection, but not much juice goes through there. Most of the juice goes straight through the uh, the accessory pancreatic duct, duct and dumps straight into the accessory uh, or the the um, minor duodenal papillae up here. Sometimes it's called the accessory papillary. Okay, so that's pancreas divisum. And yeah, people can have digestive trouble with that because uh, sometimes the pancreatic juices are always flowing into the, into the intestine and not going to get any, say anything more about that. Pancreatic tissue is made up of mainly exocrine acenar cells, 80%. There's exocrine ductal cells, 15%. Endocrine cells, only 2%. Pancreas is endocrine, right? And there's your glucagon, insulin come from those cells. I think that's good. Let's stop right there. And we'll see you in the next lecture.